Hey everyone, welcome to topic two in chapter 19. In this topic, we're gonna to talk all about inheritance patterns. Now I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I expect you to have this pretty much down after B201 and B202 and all your other biology class you've had so far. Because this is still just the basics of genetic inheritance. This is not a genetics class. When you go to take your 300 level genetics class, that's where you'll get a lot more details on this. But I just want to touch base on it and we'll talk about it from a cellular perspective a little bit, but I do want you to realize that we're just going to do this a little quickly. So today we're going to talk about Mendel's experiments, which includes his findings and the laws he created from that. We're going to also talk about how this is um, how his experiments and detail or, and his data is reflected in meiosis. And lastly, we're going to talk about mutations and their impact in cell biology. Whoops. All right, so we have a bunch of objectives, mostly terms that you need to be able to define, but as I expect, or I expect most of these are pretty sim are familiar to you already. All right, so Mendel, who was Mendel? He was a monk who um, did a lot of experimentation with pea plants. And what he did is he selected a variety of traits and he very carefully bred these pea plants together to see how the offspring would produce or would how, how they would show these phenotypes in the end. Now, Mendel didn't know anything about DNA or chromosomes or anything like that. All he wanted to do was see how these traits were inherited. And that's really the big key here is, here is that for the first time, somebody had demonstrated how traits can be passed from one generation to the next. So what's important about Mendel's experiments is that he picked traits that are all um, controlled by a single gene and that they are all on their own chromosome, which meant that he could easily watch the passing of one trait to the next generation without the interference of those other traits he was looking at. From this, what he dis uh, determined was a few things. The first is that the phenotype, he decided that a phenotype is a yellow, um, in this case, yellow pea. And what a phenotype is, it's the physical manifestation of those traits. So it's you have blonde hair, you have blue eyes, you're tall, you're short, you're whatever. Whereas your genotype is a set of genes that's con um, carried by that individual. And that genotype is what is actually in your genes, not, and it's usually used, we usually describe it with two letters, either uppercase for dominant genes or lowercase for recessive genes. Also what happened in this is that we've he figured out that each parent has one allele that's being passed on. An allele is a set of alternative forms of genes. And in a diploid cell, you're gonna have two of those. You got one allele from your mom, one allele from your dad. Now you may only show the allele from your mom because that's the dominant trait, but you still have that other set of genetic information from your dad that's just being masked by the other allele. And so that's how this works. And so if you're homozygous, you're gonna have two genes that are gonna uh, code for the same information. Whereas heterozygous, um, you'll have one gene that codes for one thing and one gene that codes for another thing. So maybe have one gene that codes for blonde hair and one gene that codes for brown hair. Now, hair color is not as simple as I pretend to be. It's just a good example. So Mendel, using this information and in all of his experiments came up with two laws. And the first is a law of segregation. In this one, what he's saying is that the maternal and the paternal alleles are going to separate from one another. So in the gametes that went to form you, you um, your dad's gametes, first of all, would separate out grandma and grandpa's genes. And in mom's um, gametes, you would separate out mom's grandma and grandpa genes. So in, in the eggs produced, you're either gonna have grandma or you're gonna have grandpa for each chromosome. Same thing goes for eggs. You're gonna have either grandma or grandpa in each sperm. Now, beyond that is the second law, which is independent assortment. We know we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. So of those 23 chromosomes that are going to end up in an egg or a sperm, they're all gonna sort independently. So as I said, you're either gonna end up with grandma or grandpa's chromosome number one. That will not have any influence on chromosome number two. Chromosome number two is still gonna be randomly either grandma or grandpa, and it doesn't matter what chromosome number one was. You could end up with a, um, a gamete that is all grandma, grandpa's genetic information. You could end up with a gamete that is all grandma's genetic information, or you could have a complete mixture or somewhere in the middle. This is how sometimes children look a lot like one member of the family, is it just depends on how this independent assortment works. So let's look at how this works in meiosis. And hopefully this is pretty familiar since we just talked about this in topic one. So here we have a plant 
or a, um, a cell and we have four chromosomes. We have two R's and two Y's. And in the R's you have the um, purple dot or the purple star and in the Y's we have either green or yellow. Now what's going to happen is in meiosis one they're going to stay together so they're going to separate out into their own but as you can see here in meiosis 2 when the sister chromatids separate out we end up with one chromosome of each now what you can see here is how the two laws have worked so independent or um, rather the law of segregation tells us that we were only going to end up with one yellow one green or one purple or one star so we end up here, every single one of these new gametes has either a purple dot or a purple star and either have a yellow chromosome or a green chromosome. That's the law of independent assortment, of segregation. The law of independent assortment is going to say that it doesn't matter if the first chromosome is a purple dot, the second one is going to be either yellow or green and it's going to be random. And that's exactly what you see here. The gametes are, you have a purple dot with a green um, chromosome or a purple dot with a yellow chromosome and the same goes for the purple stars. And this is all random and just think about the genetic variation when you go from two chromosomes in this picture to 23. And so that's how Mendel's laws are reflected in meiosis. And this is what I really want you to take away from this topic in this chapter is right here, is how do Mendel's laws of inheritance and how do we inherit um, genes work with meiosis, to, meiosis and how does this all come into play. One last note I want to touch on before we move into topic three is the mutations. We've talked about mutations before in unit two, so feel free to go back and review those if you want. But these mutations and inheritance can create several different outcomes. We have the wild type, which is our normal functioning protein. And then we have three types of loss of function mutations. This is where we have a point mutation, which is the insertion of a nucleotide or something like that, or changes the base. Um, so that we have a different amino acid. We have a truncation where the stop codon is there earlier and we have deletion where it doesn't work at all. We also have a gain of function. Now it's really important that you th remember that gain of function mutations are not always positive because you gain something is not always a good thing. It could mean that this is an overactive cell or overactive protein is going to do a lot more damage in the cell. So it's really important you understand that. And then we have conditional mutations where they only work at certain temperatures and that can also be problematic for individuals. So just be aware that there are mutations and how these work in the cell. So this is the end of our really quick topic here on genetics. As I said, I expected um, expect you to have a lot of Mendel history, a lot of genetics, and we're not going to go into Punnett squares or any of that in this class, but I want you to have an understanding of how meiosis works with Mendel's laws. And then I'll see you in topic three when we talk about how we use this all in the laboratory.